Good morning and welcome back uh, from ASCO. For those of you who were at uh, the ASCO meeting, this was a really busy meeting. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, Dong Shen, who uh, is not a stranger to this group, and therefore I will not uh, make my, my introduction very long. Um, I've, it's been a privilege to work with Dong over the last uh, several years uh, on multiple, uh, multiple projects. Uh, and um, I cannot really, you know, think of, uh, uh, you know, how many and what projects we have worked together on. Uh, but Dong's career spans uh, over more than three decades, uh, basically being a leader in cancer biology uh, and influencing uh, head and neck cancer uh, practices and care over uh, the last uh, two decades at least. Um, uh, you know, his seminal work on uh, chemo prevention uh, has opened the door for uh, further investigating this topic initially with chemo prevention and afterwards with biochemo prevention uh, and natural compounds, which is still a very hot topic in not just head and neck cancer, but other tumor types. In addition to his work on EGFR inhibition, uh, leading to the seminal paper uh, that changed the standard of care for uh, EGFR application therapy in uh, patients who receive radiation therapy. And more recently, since he joined Emory, uh, through uh, his research in nanotechnology, which uh, has also been very exciting, and he will give us a flavor of this today on, on, this, on this topic. Suffice it to say that Dong's uh, research uh, is really um, has influenced the cancer care and cancer biology uh, globally, and his work, as you can see, as you will see today, basically does not just influence head and neck cancer, but uh, also other tumor types. Um, uh, and I wanna basically, uh, again, state uh, that it has been a privilege to work with uh, Donk over the last uh, several years and continue to work to, with him as well. So uh, welcome, Donk. Okay, thank you, Nabil. <clears throat> well, I think, uh, well, I'm not talking about immunotherapy, okay? So I think uh, over the uh, ASCO in probably recent years, that this immunotherapy is a dominant field in the, you know, not only head and neck cancers, many other cancers as well. But I'm going to give you a little bit of flavor about this uh, uh, drug development by nanotechnology. It's not a prime time yet, but could be um, someday in the future. So, <clears throat> so this is, uh, as you know, the cancer statistics is just to uh, this is 2011 <clears throat> data, but there's not much change uh, right now. It's a globally, we have a huge number of patients developed every year, and also more than <clears throat> 12 million cases, and more than 7 million people die every year. So this is a huge issue, as you know. So how can we do something better for this uh, you know, huge number of mortality? So if you look at the cancer treatment history, I think as a clearly we have still surgery is the dominant uh, using more and more technology development, including robotic surgery like that. Radiation, definitely we have more and more uh, fine technology. Chemotherapy is still one of the mainstream. And molecular target therapy and immunotherapy, of course. It could be a nanotherapy as well in the future. So I think this is an evolving field. Definitely we have looking forward. So what is the driving force of this drug development? It clearly, uh, I think, is advance of biomedical science in molecular biology is the, uh, this, this is driving force. Uh, since we have DNA double helix discovery, uh, more than a century ago, and there's a lot of new technology being developed, particularly the Human Genome Project completed 2001 uh, with a huge amount of money, huge amount of time. And then now we have that technology is much more advanced, and the same human genome sequencing can be done very short period of time with a very small money too. So I think this is a really driving force, developed all this uh, new dis drug discovery, and not only in cancer and in medicine as a whole. 
So NCI has initiated several very important programs. As you know, the uh, TCGA, Cancer Genome Project, Atlas Project, that's the uh, really, really big driving for this uh, drug development. And the Cancer Stem Cell Project, and also I'm going to focus on the nanotechnology of drug development. It's still very actively ongoing. And the Cancer Chemical Biology Discovery Center, I think Emory is one of them too. This is the very important part of the, this uh, equation. And also uh, other complementary alternative medicine, uh, they now is a separate institute and they are continue uh, working for this. And a particular TCGA, the tumor bank is extremely important. Without this tumor bank, this is not possible. And also, biomedical informatics with this data, without this, is not possible either. So this is all integrated approach, basically with collaboration in university and industry together to make this thing happen. So just to focus on the TCGA, uh, as you know, that this is the, uh, established October 2006 uh, when we had a meeting in uh, Washington right after ACR, and they established this one. And it was a multiple component, as you know. So basically, <clears throat> one of the data, just this uh, example of lung adenocarcinoma, is published a while ago. But this one showing all different molecular characteristics including gene mutations, and we have more targeted therapies being developed, uh, basically in collaboration with uh, academia and industry uh, together. So we have a lot of um, personalized approach for this uh, you know, development, and clearly is a way to go uh, for the uh, cancer therapy. So this is uh, just one example of the lung again, showing the all different mutation and alteration of the genes, based on we can tailor each patient's how they treat it. Even same patients before and after treatment, their characteristics being evolving and changed. So we have really a kind of challenge, but also opportunity to address these issues. So this is a more recent data, cell report showing that driver mutations, fusion, and their implication in the development and treatment of human cancers you see the all different cancers and have all different mutations, fusions, and combine. All these things, that now we have more and more characterized. This is a put all together, uh, multiple thousands patient samples. They analyze the whole genome sequencing and then just put together this kind of report. So this is clearly will help us for further development of the drugs. So this is uh, showing that over the last uh, more than a decade, the drug, how many uh, drugs being approved, just cancer drug, for each year, uh, either new indication or new approval. So you can see that it's just a tremendous increase. 2015, 45 drugs. 2017, more than 45. Now 2018, end of the May, we have more 20 drugs has been approved or new indications. So this is a really uh, uh, important time to uh, attack these cancers using all these tools we have. So this is just an example of the, you know, 45 in 2015, and 32 drugs been listed here. So this is an amazing uh, time. When I was a fellow a long time ago, only one or two drugs approved each year, but now we have just an amazing number of five. But the important things here, what is the current challenge of drug delivery and uh, development in cancer, in medicine as a whole? As you know, complex cancer growth signaling precision approach based on many gene alterations, some of them druggable targets, some of them non-druggable targets, and also drug resistance. This is not just the chemotherapy reagents some other molecular target agents, immune checkpoint inhibitors, many others, we having facing uh, this uh, drug resistance issue is a huge issue. And also, some of them drugs are water soluble, not soluble, that issue has been also addressed. More importantly, non-specific distribution and target in human body. 
So this is just even uh, targeted agents, as you know. It goes not only cancer cell, it goes to normal cell as well. Therefore, when you go to the normal cells, the patients experience significant toxicity. This is a big, big issue. Uh, all oncologists know this one, right? And then also, uh, really, we achieved the drug in the cells, the concentration particular. The, that's why it's actually, if you look at the, uh, all the PKPD data, this based on the uh, plasma concentration, not in the cells. So this is one of the big issues. Potentially, nanotechnology can address that issues. So I think uh, this is, uh, as a whole, we have still big, big challenge for this uh, cancer drug therapy. So that's kind of introduction what I like to do this morning. And the nanotherapeutics is a smart delivery of anti-cancer drugs by nanotechnology. This is a NCI nanotechnology, uh, nanotechnology initiative definition of nanotechnology is defined as science, engineering, and technology conduct at the nanoscale, which is about one to hundred nanometers. That that's the one we are dealing with, uh, uh, nanotherapeutics, particular drugs. So this uh, cartoon showing that the size comparison, if you look at the tennis ball, that's a 10 to the eighth nanometer. If you look at the uh, glucose, just a one nanometer, Antibodies about 10, virus about 100, bacteria 1,000, which is one micron, cancer cells tens of thousands. So I think this one uh, basically, you know, how nano nanoparticles belong to here, basically between here, the uh, glucose to the virus particle, and there's many the nano, uh, you know cargo or some people call cargo or some people call payload. And this one, polymers, many of them, this is a, a biodegradable liposomes, cyclodextrins, dendrimers, the viral, usually non functional viral particles, gold, uh, micelle structure, carbon nanotube, quantum dots, and DNA. So I'm going to show some of this data, what we involve, and also de developing uh, in, the, in the future as well. So class of nanoparticles, just to show you again, but there's a, some advantage or disadvantage of this, each class of the uh, nanoparticles, liposome, micelle structure, dendrimers, protein-based, iron oxide, gold, quantum dots, carbon nanotube, and DNA RNA nanoparticles. So this is, a, I'm not gonna show you all those details, but there's a clearly what kind of indication you're gonna use, what kind of nanoparticles in each cases. So, this is how you have to decide about the what way which, we, which will be the best fit for that you propose. So, of course, is a, this uh, nano particles can be applied many different ways: drug screening, drug delivery. Uh, I'm going to focus more this morning. This gene delivery. Uh, some of them sRNA. I'm going to give it to you and early detection, and also diagnosis, and monitoring during the treatment. So those are all the application, again, not only cancers, but all medicine as a whole. So our group actually extensively reviewed this area of the last uh, more than a decade, and basically uh, ligand-specific delivery, which is active targeting, so if you look at the compared to this, this uh, rocket concept, nanoparticles is a carrier basically, and then draw, you can conjugate it, and this targeting device or ligand can lead uh, this whole system to the cells. So this is very important part, how you can design what kind of ligand and then what tar target receptor, you target the receptors uh, particularly on the cell surface. So this is a very important concept. And then you can already think about what you're gonna do in delivery with certain drugs. So this is also uh, our review paper, uh, quite extensively cited. And this basically showing that <coughs> certain ligand uh, conjugate nanoparticles go to the uh, 
sense of cells with a high density of a receptor compared to the normal cell, which is low density, then this nanoparticle basically goes to the majority of the cancer cells. That's a whole concept of the uh, active targeting in many cases. So this one, ligand, ha can be used all different uh, uh, stuff here, uh, monoclonal antibodies, and fragment, peptide, antibodies, small molecules, aptomers, and many other proteins as well. So this is being addressed there. And actually, uh, we wrote to one of the uh, papers not too long ago about this concept. So ligand, we have this just a small partial list. But I'm going to call, talk about some folic acid, which is targeting folic acid receptors on the cell surface. And transferrin, also a transferrin receptor. And EGFR receptor is targeting by this EGFR incomplete antibody or fragment, single chain EGFR uh, uh, fragment. We can actually, using this one ligand to target the EGFR receptor and many others. So 2005, NCI initiated about the Nanotechnology Alliance. This is National Alliance. And uh, some of them um, centers in New England here, and Southeast, Emory is one of them, and also Midwest, Southwest, and West Coast as well. So we had, uh, at that time, nine centers been awarded, including Emory Georgia Tech, uh, Shuming Ni actually uh, 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 was PI of that overall. And also uh, CNPP, or Nanotechnology Platinum Partnership uh, Program. So uh, after five years later, we also awarded that one. And then also we have a training centers and also early career development peoples also uh, uh, got award throughout the country. This is quite a large effort by the NCI to develop nanotechnology uh, for particularly uh, cancer treatment and uh, diagnosis. So this is the initial award is 2005, and we have a six program at the time, projects rather. So in fact, except me, everybody disappeared from the uh, <laughs> Emory of Georgia Tech. Shuming is currently at uh, University of Illinois, and Ruth is in Wisconsin, and many others is going different places anyhow. So we had a six program, and I was in charge of the nanotherapeutics uh, program at the time. And also, uh, 2007, we established head and neck cancer spore program here. And we had a four program at that time. And one of the program, uh, the project, is in nanotherapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, leading by Shiming and myself. So this one, uh, so I'm going to give you a few uh, drugs we've been uh, formulated and uh, characterized biologically uh, for this uh, cancer uh, drug treatment. So first one, we did the uh, uh, Taxol formulation, uh, which is pretty much uh, still we have actively using drug and using folate as a ligand. And the heparin, which is a polysugar structure, uh, this one uh, using for the carriers, all right? So basically uh, formulated this one, and then after formulation, this is a uh, the electron uh, microscope uh, pictures here. The size about about 50 or 60 uh, nanometers. It's an adequately good size. If you're too small, it could be filtrated through the kidney very quickly. Therefore, sustaining the blood circulation is not that good. Uh, but if it's too big, that's also problematic. So I think between about 30 to 40 to about one or 200 nanometer size is the adequate size for the nanotherapeutic nanoparticles. So after formulation, we look at the uh, biology activity. This is an in vitro study. Uh, you know, colony formation assay, and this is a control, about 12 days assay, and this is a free taxol treated, somewhat decrease, of course, and then this one without ligand, taxol, heparin, uh, this is a structure, and very similar to free taxol, but when you're adding folate, which is a ligand target to the, this is a cells heavily uh, 
uh, density of the uh, uh, the the follicle receptor on the cell surface, the cells, and basically wipe out the cells they are very effectively. Um, and also we did the in vivo study. Uh, this is a uh, nude mice and this control and blue line, uh, uh, rather the white, the white, the red, the, the yellow line, that's the free taxol. And blue line is the uh, without ligand formulated nanoparticle. And the purple color here, there's a without, the with ligand, which is uh, folic acid right here. So if you see that, there's a huge difference. The free taxol, somewhat control at the beginning. This is an injection of the uh, uh, nanoparticle through the tail vein. You see that nicely downregulated or controlled and then eventually resistant grew back, this uh, free taxol group. But nanoparticle group is stay down all the way here. And some of them, this is a uh, seven mice of these two groups, taxol group and uh, nanoparticles with a follicle receptor target and showing that it's all tumors is disappearing. This is very effective uh, drug, in fact. But one of the concern we had later, we had learned that, and this one on your tail bed injection, because of the, we believe heparin, there's a lot of hematomas developed in these mice. So it's quite uh, concerning uh, that time, but nevertheless, this is quite effective uh, drug in, in to, compared to the uh, free taxol. So another drug we've been using uh, to formulating the uh, cisplatin, that's another common drug we're using for uh, many uh, cancers, including head and neck and lung and others. Uh, basically, uh, toxicity is, as you know, one of the big issues. Nephrotoxicity, peripheral neuropathy, autotoxicity, nausea vomiting, bone marrow toxicity, all these things is quite, it's a good drug, but it's, this is a really bad part. Still, we are struggling, and many patients are actually struggling because of the toxicity. So we're using the EGFR as a ligand, the single chain EGFR, and that one we try to deliver to the EGFR positive tumor cells. And also, again, uh, heparin has a carrier. And uh, the after formulation, the size about 150 to 200 nanometers, which is a uh, pretty good size and slightly negative charge. So this formulation part, we did it uh, with collaboration in Schumann Nies lab at that time. As so this is cisplatin and this heparin we formulated first and then conjugate later with the uh, single chain EGFR. This is about 25 kilodalton protein. And then the size of this final product, size is about, about 150 or 200 nanometer size. Before EGFR is much smaller, about 20, 30 nanometers. So because of this is a protein is an increase. And this showing here, what is the uh, basically release in the, uh, in the, this is petri dish and not the uh, uh, animal body, but that's one, when you have a water condition, it doesn't release. But if you get the PBS, which is a saline, and increase gradually up to, this is time point 20, 40, 60, 80 hours, and this is about three or four days later, about 60, 70% drugs can release uh, gradually. So this is a, possibly true in, in vivo when you see the uh, activity. So let me show you some of the data. So this is, a, we look at the uh, platinum concentration actually uh, major uh, after uh, uh, giving to the treated cells. This is a in vitro. And these are two different cells we use there. H292, these cells highly express EGFR in lung cancer cells. And H520 cells is no, no EGFR, very low expression. So as you see here, this one, uh, EHDDP, that's, that's the EGFR target uh, cisplatin. And you see the huge uh, increase when you go into the cell, we can measure uh, platinum concentration 
here compared to the others here. But this one is just a physically mixed. But this one is actually conjugated one. And then, however, H520 cells with EGFR negative cells, we don't see that. Again, okay, very low concentration. And then also we did the uh, knockdown SHRNA, SIRNA. As you see that this is uh, before and after. Clearly we see the big difference in terms of uh, platinum concentration in the cells. And then cell viol uh, viability assays, as you see that, and there is a higher concentration, cell viability gradually decreased, but still we see the big difference compared to the uh, uh, free uh, cisplatin versus actual uh, uh, nanoparticle treated cells here, okay? So basically, I think this is uh, in vitro data. We're clearly showing that platinum is more effective to deliver it into the uh, EGFR positive cells. And then we have uh, in vivo distribution. Uh, this is a uh, mice blood and then time point here. And then again, uh, platinum concentration we measure comparing free drug, free cisplatin, H, just a heparin without ligand, it, with ligand, single EGFR nanoparticles. You can see that, and clearly we see that more and more, and the higher concentration we see it. And also we look at the uh, just tissue, the liver, spleen, kidney, and tumor here, but EGFR actually many of the, these uh, organs has each of some EGFR receptor there, so we, we can see that some higher concentration in platinum. But more importantly, tumor here, the, the, this EGFR uh, targeted nanoparticles, clearly we can see that better. Uh, for highest concentration, we can see the four hours and the 24 hours are somewhat decrease as well. So this is an anti-tumor activity in mice and this is a tumor volume. Uh, the blue is the control. Uh, the pink is the free cisplatin. And this one, light blue, that's uh, without targeting nanoparticles. And this with targeting. So clearly with targeting is better. Interestingly, mm -hmm. uh, still, the HDDP compared to free drug, and the free drug is more active in this animal model. But uh, the best, uh, most effective one is EHDDP. That one is the highest one. And now we will look at the uh, animal body weight, just to look at this um, rough toxicity assay. Uh, then this pink one, clearly this is a free drug and quite toxic to the mice. And the weight loss is quite significant. Compared to other, we didn't see that much uh, toxicity, particularly EH. DDP, which is green color here. And also you can look at the uh, other tissue, particularly the renal toxicity, is, as you know, they're quite significant in cisplatin. And this one, BUN, I believe, and then DDP, uh, highest, and this control, normal BUN in mice is about 20 uh, milligram per deciliter, which is very similar to humans. And the cisplatin is uh, actually giving a, a BUN increase. And the other two, particularly this one, almost same as control. And then creatinine level is actually the same thing too. And then also body, uh, the kidney weight, and actually someone decreased the kidney weight with cisplatin treated, but the other uh, is, does not decrease the kidney weight, which is again, toxicity uh, uh, issues. And we can uh, look at the uh, each, organ size. So this, this is a um, uh, treated group, saline treated, DDP, this uh, free drug uh, formulated, but this is a EGFR target formulated. But these three is so very similar to saline control without treatment, but this one cells are swollen and some start to damage. So there's a clearly, compared to cisplatin, this drugs actually better toxicity profile at least in the animal model, we can see. Okay, so I'd like to talk about something, SRNA delivery, which is a gene delivery. It's been almost all preclinical studies being done at, at the moment using uh, naked SRNA, liposome formulated, and some of them other formulated as well. So lots of uh, data is out there. 
So roughly we can say about strategy to target in vivo SRN delivery, liposome-based, polymer-based, peptide-based, aptamer-based, all this one actually you get targeting um, or formulating SRNA specific. Um, so one of the uh, target SRNA is the uh, ribonucleide, ribonucleide reductase, uh, which is important enzyme, there's two unit, RRM1 and RRM2. Particular RRM2 is important for the cancer biology because of this one expressed high during the G1 S phase when the DNA replication happens. So this is right, these steps. So inhibit this RRM2 perhaps will be important for the uh, cell growth inhibitions. So this uh, nanoparticle actually formulated by uh, Dr. Mark Davis from Caltech uh, several years ago using cyclodextrin, uh, this shape like this, and then adamantin with a pegylated, and then f actually target with the transferrin target, um, the receptor target. This is transferrin as a ligand, and then srna, whatever. In that time, RM2 srna, they formulated. So, in fact, uh, this compound moved into clinical trial. The phase one trial was conducted as City of Hope in Los Angeles. And basically what they did, after formulated and giving to the patient, and then this actual figure of the TM showing that this uh, dextra, uh, dextrin with the adamantin, you can see by the uh, uh, TM uh, study. So those formulated nanoparticles delivered to the patient, this patient tissue, and showing that it's receptor, I mean the, the transferrin receptor, I believe, and then go into the, some nanoparticle into the cells, and some of them just attached to the cell surface. And then using the patient uh, biopsy samples, uh, they look at the uh, before and after treatment uh, RM2 mRNA expression. Uh, as you see here, the patient number A, pre and post, you can see the decrease, the mRNA expression. Patient number B, same thing. Patient number C, this is actually twice delivered to the patients, decrease. And then protein expression also somewhat decreased as well. So this is a biology activity. You can see it. And this uh, figure showing that this is also the, I, I'm not sure you can see it, but there is uh, like a green lights. And this is a post treatment. You can see that couple of blood, which is, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, first is tagging a nanoparticle, you can see it. And this one, probably a couple of them here too. And this is a second infusion. You can see more uh, here. This ma majority of the, uh, this tissue of phase one study was melanoma patients, uh, interestingly. <clears throat> and also they did the uh, so-called race technique, rapid amplification of cDNA end, and look at the uh, actual sequence SRNA deliver what happens on the tissue. So uh, again, uh, this one, the cell line control and then patient samples uh, before and after. Uh, this is a bef uh, after patient number A, after patient number B. They didn't see that much but patient number C, after second infusion, before and after both, you can see the nicely band, about 200 base pair. This is correct size of the uh, RMT RNA uh, here. And then they did a sequence. That this is cell line, this is the patient samples, uh, C2 samples, exactly the same cutting uh, cleavage, cleavage site. They can identify it by the sequence. So clearly delivered sRNA, you can see the product, what happened in the tissue, in the patients. So this very nice paper is published in Nature 2010, but I think it's because of financial issues, uh, the calendar, there's a day of uh, pharmaceutical small companies uh, couldn't sustain, I believe, whatever reason. So we did actually, uh, with the collaboration with that group, uh, Kela 1, that's the uh, nanoparticles that we have. This is an in vivo study. We're just showing that 
uh, uh, water uh, D5 sam the, you know, group, and this is an unformulated SRNA, uh, nano, uh, not nanoparticle, SRNA. And also, this is a controlled scrambled uh, SRNA, and then this formulated 5 milligram per kick, 10 milligram per kick. And then you can see that this curve, three controls, all tumor nicely grew, uh, but this one, color O1, they call this nanoparticle as a color O1, color o one, whatever reason. But here, uh, they have uh, clearly a growth inhibition, and then 10 milligram is even higher compared to the 5 milligram, so nicely uh, growth inhibition. We can see it here. This is, again, control versus treated. Uh, mice. And the weight is not much changed, so it's not really toxic. And then uh, at the last uh, experiment, sacrifice the animals and measure the tumor size, we so clearly see that difference compared to these three and this nanoparticle treated uh, mice's tumor is much smaller. <clears throat> so after that, uh, we continue work with the uh, uh, particular this project, uh, photothermal therapy of cancer, particularly using the gold nanoparticle. Uh, some of you know that Dr. Uh, Mustafa El Said is a very well-known person in terms of gold nanoparticle development, and he's a member of the National Academy of Science because of that work. Uh, so we work together. So he's formulated and characterized physically about these nanoparticles, and our group uh, mainly doing the uh, biological, particularly in vivo study as well. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of them data. So why gold nanoparticles? I think one of the issue is gold nanoparticles, when you pegylate it or some other modification chemically in the surface, is a very easy to modification than any other uh, you know, nanoparticle uh, you know, what we know of. So this is very uh, good things. Uh, another one, it could be a uh, 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 well-known and enhanced permeability and detention effect. Therefore, the labeled particles go into the uh, tumor tissue. Some of them point is still controversial by this concept, but nevertheless, uh, we expect that. And then uh, imaging is very well visualized by this gold. And also, the important thing is a very high conversion rate uh, from energy uh, to the heat. When you hit with a laser, and this is a very highly uh, uh, converted energy, convey that to the tissue or cells. Uh, therefore, therapeutic effect, particular photothermal, is very high than any other uh, nanoparticles uh, that we are uh, dealing with. So the, what formulation here? Uh, basically, uh, using uh, plasmic gold, uh, this is a nano rod, but like a block shape, and then surface modified with pegylated uh, mainly. And then, uh, interestingly, uh, RF is a repampin, which is anti TB drugs, and has very high affinity conjugation and also when you laser, and it is even more killing effect of the cells. So we don't know the exact mechanism, but uh, nevertheless, there's, I think this RF uh, conjugation is clearly better than any other uh, compound when they formulate it. So they use that one. And then we have control, this is a TM study, and this is a pegylated one, and this is a RF with uh, photothermal therapy cells dying. Uh, this actually paper in published in PNS last year. And also a uh, biologic effect, um, that this basically in vitro study, no treatment, um, uh, just a gold nanorod alone, and the laser alone. Uh, this cells just uh, hit with a small laser, it not, doesn't affect. But after uh, pegylated and with uh, laser, you see that apoptosis increase, and also RF, uh, much increase, and also increased concentration somewhat increase as well here with without RF, this one. So it's a clearly we see that, and then we'll also look at the uh, prop cleavage, caspase 3 cleavage, some other, and with laser, clearly we can see they nicely induce those apoptotic molecules. 
And then in vivo study, showing here, just pay attention, last two lane here. This is the uh, laser with high dose of just pegylated golden nanorod. And with this one is a RF conjugated, 2.5 nanometer, which is low concentration, but actually all tumor growth is flat out, no growth at all. And here, these two tumors, just representing mice here, didn't show any tumor cells here. So this is a very effective treatment too. But whether we can apply this one to any other. In fact, uh, Dr. Elside did uh, in vivo study in animal, particular cat cancer in Cairo, Egypt. And then they published that one not too long ago. And then I think more than 80% of the tumors actually wipe out by this method. The nanorod injection tumor, uh, particularly the sarcomas, and also uh, uh, cannot the uh, mouse cancer. And then with laser, and then just, uh, of course, it's a government support, and they didn't charge anything to the uh, pet owners, but uh, they have very effective treatment here. It could be uh, utilized in the, you know, in the, if you're humans, it could be like a skin cancer or some of them could be very effective. So uh, anyhow, so this is general model, just looking at the uh, cell proliferation. And again, this one is most effective compared to the other controls. And also we look at the uh, proteomics and the last of proteins been identified, some of them overlapping with between the treatment. But in terms of detailed characterization, what kind of role on this is still uh, is not really well defined, but nevertheless, we see the, a lot of proteins involved in this tri treatment here. And this, another int interesting thing is here, we look at the actually long-term effect. So basically, if you this injection of the nanorod, and going through one through seven, 14 days, 30 days, 15 months. This is very long for the mice. And then uh, we look at the liver accumulation of nanorods. It's still there. It's not really much change. Slightly decreased, but still there. We just uh, collect all the samples of the tissue and, uh, and analyze this uh, nanorod uh, weight. And you see that. It's very, and then some of them tissue like a spleen and decrease, but still there. And this kidney is decrease and still there, and also lung. So what happens this one? Is it any damaged tissue? This is safety study, of course. So look at the uh, HNA staining, lung, one month, 15 months. It's about the same, nothing much really damaged in the lung by this golden nanorod. Spleen, same thing. Liver, kidney, we don't see that much. Also, EM study, TM study showing that liver and spleen, both organs are here, but it's sitting there in the gold here. These are one month and 15 months. This doesn't harmful to the tissue, but sitting there. So it could be you know, long-term effect. If you translate to the humans, it could be still in the, in the, in the body. So, that could be concerning, but didn't show any uh, toxicity, at least in mice. So this just to summarize what, the, we, uh, what I'm talking about here, particularly this 15 months toxicity didn't show much uh, toxicity, at least in vivo. So last uh, few minutes, I'm going to talk about the DNA nanotechnology. Uh, this one currently, the DNA, as you know, the genotype. Here, when this is the base of the, all these genes, as you know. But uh, also, the scrambled DNA, we can make building blocks. And this is a nanostructure. You can make all different shapes, in fact. So uh, currently, uh, Yonggang Ki from Biomedic Engineering Department, uh, he was a recruit from the uh, Boston. And currently, uh, Actually, they made all different shape of the DNA nanoparticles. This is so-called DNA origami. You know, the uh, Japanese people making all different shapes of animals like that. That's what they call origami. So that's why all different shapes, they can make it. It's published in very uh, well uh, in recent years. So they're making uh, uh, three different 
uh, DNA nanoparticles, tetrahedron, which is uh, four-phased shape, and then uh, rod shape, small one and big one. Of course, the big one is more loading site compared to the smaller one, and this is the uh, image of that. And also, uh, look at the uh, cellular internalization of DNA nanoparticle treated cells, and then we tagged fluorescence and look at the uh, actual image intensity, and clearly we can see that and time goes up, you can get more uh, high intensity, you can see it. And this is a TM study. Uh, this is because the DNA structure didn't show in the tissue by the TM, we uh, actually uh, tagging the gold. And then you can visualize by the uh, TM. So this is the one, uh, uh, I think it's the start the treatment going into the cells. And some of them, uh, early phase, line up on the cells and start going into through the invagination here. And inside the cell, you can see it. So this is a, uh, clearly you can see the gold tagging uh, intact. And that means that this one is going into the cells. Some of them split because of the uh, whatever mechanism in the cells. So in, the, in terms of uh, in vivo effect sRNA, particularly a BCL2 sRNA, we formulated and, and tested in the, this is case of the uh, lung cancer cell lines. We can see somewhat activity here, uh, not strong, but definitely we see that some activity uh, basically decreased the uh, tumor growth inhibition. Mm -hmm. Another concept is sera seronostics with the therapy and diagnostics. Actually, when you come uh, conjugate together, you can actually target in both uh, treatment, and then you can uh, follow exactly what happens. So this one currently uh, being developed, this is still, of course, in vivo study. Basically, uh, this particular study showing the anti-PD-1 gold nanoparticles actually tagging and inject to the patients and do the CT scan, and then look at the, uh, uh, the uh, basically high, intermediate, low intensity of the signals, and then you can predict which patient may have response or not response because of based on the tagging and the intensity where this uh, PD-L1 tagging golden nanoparticles go into the systems, so you can actually see it. So this is the uh, one of the concept, of course, this is a mice and uh, conjugated uh, nanoparticles with a PDL1, and then inject the mice, CT scan done, and then you can, some of mice has a very low activity, intermediate, high, high activity, and this one actually, anti-tumor activity is much higher compared to this, so we can actually estimate what kind of things we can expect. So this is another uh, animal uh, study showing that here, these are high, intermediate, low, and then, in fact, this high is much lower, I mean higher, and the tumor activity we can predict when we go into the uh, systems. So I think there's uh, just a few minutes of clinical trials, and a lot of them actually still in the baby stage, uh, using some of them existing drug, anti-cancer drug, or some of the molecular target agents is being developed. Some of them studies, are small studies ongoing uh, here, and also protein-based nanoparticle, RNAi-based nanoparticles, some of them are going on now. Uh, whether this is, again, not the prime time yet, but I think it's probably some of them, I think it will be stand out. Um, so this is a combination of the, uh, this is an old drug, this first generation, like a Roxane example. Uh, some of them, this uh, NC6004, uh, this is a cisplatin nanoparticles in clinical trials ongoing. I think the head and the cancer is uh, uh, recently embarked uh, this NC6004, cisplatin nanoparticles with 5-APOS toximab combination as a first-line therapy. Uh, currently, we opened this uh, study as well in Emory, but I think it's in hold right now. Uh, basically, they formulated, this is one of the Japanese company, I believe, and then these uh, bi-blocks called polymers, and basically uh, uh, this is a uh, final product, and they clearly see that uh, big anti-tumor activity compared to the free cisplatin. 
in terms of toxicity, those things are also uh, better uh, than uh, free drugs, as shown earlier in my study as well. But uh, we'll see what happens in the near future. So I think uh, cancer treatment, clearly, this nanotherapy, I hope we're move, moving into mainstream in the near future uh, for the cancer treatment. Uh, so I think I'm showing this slide is many drugs is because of the old regulations. Sometimes there's a good drug, it just fell off. But you know, nanotherapy could be one of them, but not all of them, maybe some of them, and maybe uh, succeed. So uh, I think clearly nanotechnology-driven drug delivery and developments are highly promising field in biomedical engineering and science. It may open a new chapter of therapy, including cancers and other diseases as well. The important thing is academia, industry, and regulatory agents must work together for effective and timely development of these new drugs. I think this is an all collaboration effort so incredibly small size can make a huge impact for future oncology and medicine. And I finally, I'd like to thank for the uh, Emory Sport team. We just submitted a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we didn't include the nano here because of the, uh, as you know, the sport is a translational focus. The nano is not prime time, we believe. So we're more focusing the, uh, the immunology aspect. But I really appreciate all these collaborators work together including Dr. Saba. And uh, this is the last slide. Thank you very much. All right. All right.